Michigan versus everybody, just the way we like it. Bring it. Next on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Yes, Clark. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Dennis, hands you hard. Stay still, one. Brady gets terrific. Clemson, get it. Touchdown, night again. Schultz, just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Colazar at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Winner. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace, and the Get Shorty episode starring Jimmy Harbaugh continues on. The fakest, dumbest, stupidest contrived scandal in college football history carries on as well. Is that Connor Stallions or Patrick Dempsey on the sidelines for Michigan State Central Michigan? How about Sports Illustrated and Pat Forty rolled out this week with Skullduggery from the ball boys. Michigan apparently has the smartest ball boys in college football. They are able to understand a team's signals, and so they can themselves signal whether it will be a run or a pass. This actually got printed by the artist formerly known as Sports Illustrated. We've reached Julie Swetnick proportions of this story. Next stop, Michael Avenatti. The Washington, I'm sorry, the Wall Street Journal, Michigan rescinds contract offer to Harbaugh. Next day, Michigan offers contract extension to Harbaugh. Come on, man. No self-awareness, no standards, no accountability. But I repeat myself. And when it comes to American media nowadays, par for the course. Here's all you need to know. Here's all you need to know. You know what? I was gonna, I was gonna belabor this point, but just watch this. This is Dave Portnoy from Barstool, noted Michigan fan, filming Ohio State's signals and putting them on Twitter. As of October 28th, 3.6 million views. <laughs> he says, I guess I just committed international espionage. This is the dumbest, stupidest, fakest controversy slash scandal in college football history. All of you that have bought into this are morons. Everything that's been said about this for the last couple of weeks thereabouts are some of the stupidest things you've ever heard. And all of us are dumber for having heard them. So I could go into more details, actually, but I think, I think I'm just going to leave it right here with this comment. 
We've been kicking your ass. We're going to kick your ass. And we're going to keep kicking your ass. Go Blue. Steve Dace here, and we get asked a lot, hey, how can we support what you guys are doing at Michigan Podcast? Well, now is a great time to become one of our supporters on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast is where you can go. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. And if you go there, we're going to make you a little jingle. Uh, in fact, you would have gotten these a few months ago, before the, long before the season even started. All of my 2023 football futures bets I've made thus far. I can't recommend a selection any more than I bet this myself. And last year, if you followed my football futures bets and you bet alongside of me, you made a pretty nice ROI chunk of change by the time the season ended. So keep up to date on all things we think and do uh, here at Michigan Podcast patreon.com at Michigan podcast, but more importantly, just five bucks a month. And chances are, you're going to make a lot more money than that following our sports betting selections, patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. Again, patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. And thanks to all of you that have been supporting us already. We appreciate each and every one of you go blue. All right, that's enough. Let's talk some ball. And for that, it's time for the 10-Minute War with our good friend Mark Rogers. Check out his outstanding channel right here on YouTube, the voice of college football. And, of course, Michigan back in action this week against Purdue off the bye and then the stretch run against Penn State, Maryland, and Ohio State. We've got the initial college football playoff rankings coming out later tonight as of uh, the time that we are taping this interview. So let's get into all of that. And more, Mark. Let's start there. By the way, welcome aboard, brother. Happy Halloween. Let's let's start there with the the playoff rankings tonight. I expect your Buckeyes to be number one uh, based on resume. If you kind of look at the history of the college football playoff rankings, one of the things the trend lines you see is the the team and, and or teams considered to have the best resumes up to this point uh, tend to be uh, favored very highly by the committee. Uh, in order to kind of let things play themselves out, figuring, hey, if I rank Ohio State number one, they'll play Michigan on the field. We'll get our our answer. So I can just go off of resume right now, right? Uh, Same thing with the Georgia. You know, if I'm I'm not going to put them in the top four, but they end up winning out, and teams like Missouri will be ranked, Tennessee will be ranked, Alabama or LSU out of the West will be ranked, and that'll give us our answer so we don't have to project. Because this committee doesn't like to take a lot of risks, likes to have – you know, CYA and the ability to retcon their answers later should they need be. So you agree or disagree that your Buckeyes you think will be number one tonight? Well, I do agree. And we had this conversation recently, Steve, that uh, it's been obvious from the college football playoff committee's approach that they play out scenarios in the future to make sure Mm -hmm. CYA, yes, they don't want to put themselves in a position a la 2014 where they have to make moves that are very difficult to to defend uh so they they look ahead as much as possible i believe i tend to think that they're going to go with georgia number one Hmm. ohio state is the best wins on the field but georgia in its last two games against good opponents decent opponents kentucky and florida has been a dominant football team we know that the committee looks at the resume of course the resume is probably first and foremost but there is also that that football eyeball test of performance and level of dominance, game control. And while that's not been on Georgia's side for much of the season, it has been recently. And I also believe that there's a recency bias. So the resume isn't necessarily just a data point, data point, data point, and they all equal uh, and are evaluated the same. I do think that there's a recency bias to who who is playing well right now. And Ohio State's playing good football. They're playing capable football. They've they've taken out probably the two best teams of any team uh, in the country, to your point about the resume and a nice road win ag- against Wisconsin. And Michigan's the other they're the other end of the spectrum in regards to dominant play against lesser competition. Georgia seems to be somewhere in between. And I do think that there's a lingering defending champion bias that's ingrained. I hope you're wrong because I, I just don't think 
any of those arguments are strong. Michigan has played a stronger strength of schedule than Georgia has. Georgia's is 84th. Michigan is 68th. Michigan's looked a lot more impressive against that schedule overall than Georgia has against its. Ohio State absolutely has the best resume for sure in the country. We're gonna they're gonna have at least two wins against teams that are in the top 15 when those rankings come out tonight against Notre Dame uh, and Penn State, and one of them was on the road. I, I, I mean, I don't I don't see a rationale for ranking Georgia number one in the playoff rankings at all, other than they're the defending national champions, and you're supposed to take this kind of season by season in its own you know, uh, in its own microcosm. I, I mean, I, I don't, man. I, I, they haven't been as dominant. There's not a, there is not a, a person who does this for a living that has Georgia power rated number one over Michigan. Nobody does. So they're not number one in, by any, they're not more impressive than Michigan in any schedule adjusted, uh, algor- you know, formula that you, you'll find anywhere in the sport. And Ohio State's resume is clearly superior I, I really don't know what the case for Georgia is being number one other than they were they won the championship last year. You are better at this than I am, Steve. I, I do a poor job of projecting this. What I do is I wait for the committee to make its selections, and then I attempt to tear it apart. Uh, I, like you, hope that I'm wrong. I just think that there is a there is an argument for Georgia at number one. Uh, and of course, Ohio State and Michigan meet head to head, so they don't. They, yeah, there's there's a number of outs here down the road, and uh, I think that they can justify Ohio State or Michigan number one, uh, certainly because Michigan has just been so dominant, uh, more so now, than. Now any I'm hoping country. Heather. I hope they listen to Heather Heather Denich, who hates Michigan, and has made that pretty clear the last few years. I'm hoping they listen to her and rank Michigan fifth, because. I'm just telling. I, I mean, I, I want all the motivation. Give it, give it all, give it all. Okay, two weeks of you guys suck. Wouldn't have won a damn game of consequence. And you even, you even program the ball boys to know the plays and signal them in according to Pat Forty. Two weeks of that nonsense. Then you throw in we're the number five team. I hope they listen to Heather Dinich, man. I'm looking for all the motivational fodder to give these guys after after just destroying people for two months I can possibly find. Now, I don't think that'll be the case, but it wouldn't shock me if Michigan was fourth. And, and ultimately, it doesn't matter where Michigan and Ohio State are ranked. It doesn't matter where Georgia is ranked because the caliber of games remaining on each of those schedules are going to determine themselves. What, what I am more interested in are, are um, where, what happens with like Oregon and Texas? Yes. Who's the highest rated one loss team? What do you do? You know, there was a situation a few years ago where Michigan State beat us in a, you know, I got a controversial call, but really it was an even game almost all the way through. Uh, that was the Kenneth Walker game. They end up, you know, pulling the upset against us. They, they And we drop in the playoff rankings. The next week they go to Purdue and just get absolutely lambasted. And the committee jumps us ahead of Purdue. And I told you at the time, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not. I'm not comfortable with, hey, I'm glad as a fan, but as an analyst, I'm not comfortable with the results on the field don't matter. Well, then Michigan State played um, Ohio State and got a second loss, so that made that point irrelevant. But I'm a little uncomfortable with this idea of just you know dropping uh, Oklahoma below Texas like they didn't play a game against one another, right? So I'm, I'm interested to see where Oregon and Texas are. Texas would have the best win of any one-loss team, and – Frankly, maybe as good a win as anybody in college football has this year, going on the road and winning at Alabama. But I'm, I'm. Those are the things I'm kind of looking for when you start figuring out, the, as you pointed out earlier, the crafting of narratives for later. They don't have to worry about crafting narratives where Michigan, Ohio State, Georgia are concerned, or even Florida State. Right? Those teams, you know, basically control their own destiny. It's the narratives that they're going to try to craft in advance of the teams that don't. That's what I'm interested in. Yeah, so you're separating the approach of the evaluation of the game results and the metrics on the field and honoring head-to-head regardless of what the game looked like, where it was played, versus there's a nuance to making the argument, for example, that Oregon just went to Utah and just annihilated a team that Mm -hmm. was extremely strong 
limited at quarterback. We know the limitations and know that they're not an elite team, but still going to a place where there were 18 consecutive wins by the Utes and dominating that game and then having the one loss be very understandable. You go to Washington, if you believe in the three-point swing of a Vegas spread when you're playing on the road, especially Husky Stadium, one of the more difficult places to play, Danny, Dan Lanning either makes, depending on your viewpoint, either a, 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 a string of illogical bad decisions or they just went against him regardless. And then you've got a missed field goal at the gun that virtually it's a it's a tie game. It's an overtime game aside from a missed field goal at the gun. Oregon did practically everything possible uh, to lose that game and had two of its best cornerbacks out the second half and still took Washington to the wire on the road. So do you just say, regardless of what happens, regardless of what we watch, regardless of any other argument concerning this game, it's a Washington win and an Oregon loss, and it needs to be honored. Or, because of all this context, you could argue Oregon is better than Washington on a neutral field. Well said. Well said. So, as we look down the stretch here in the Big Ten, and, you know, we have been talking since this summer about the tiebreaker situation. What happens if you're dealing with well, Michigan loses at Penn State, Penn State loses at Ohio State, Ohio State loses at Michigan. And in those scenarios, you'd get down to the fifth tiebreaker, which is um, winning percentage of divisional opponents, which, by the way, right now, I, I went and looked, Michigan and Ohio State are actually tied there too right now. So Minnesota's uh, little resurgence here, the last, and Nebraska's little resurgence here the last few weeks has, has helped Michigan. So right now, Michigan and Ohio State are each seven, and, their non divisional opponents are each seven and eight. And Penn State's are six and nine. So, so, so that's how close. That's how. Yeah, that's. And I've also projected what I think it's going to be. And I think Ohio State's got an edge. Think I think I do, but in the in the Big Ten West, who knows? Right. At this point, you're spinning the wheel of destiny there. Why don't we just do this? If we're going to do all these things with no divisions, instead of having it come down to all these tiebreakers, just do this. If if there's not a head to head, a clear head to head advantage, in 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 a, in one on one or a group of teams, then since the since the goal was to get rid of divisions to put your best foot forward for the college football playoff, right? Right. So since that was the goal, we, we go through head to head. If if it's two teams, whoever won, that's the tiebreaker. If it's three or four teams, and if one team doesn't have the clear head to head tiebreaker against everybody else, then here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna have nine tiebreakers. We're just gonna do this. We're just gonna go to the college football playoff rankings. Just do that. I mean, th- this was all done to impress the playoff rankings anyway. So then just go to the college football. Would, would you rather have to impress the college football playoff committee or go to a 14th tiebreaker? That's ridiculous to me. At least if you know it's the college football playoff committee, okay, you know style points matter. So so tack went on there at the end. You know they're paying attention. If it's the ninth or 10th or 7th or 8th, or, or we're down to freaking coin flips here. I don't want it coming down to that. At least if it's down to the committee, then I've got some kind of say in my own fate. You know, I could I could run up some impressive scores, and if I don't, then that's a me problem. Rather than we're down here to fifth and sixth tiebreakers, like we're looking at in the Big Ten right now, potentially. I understand your point. I don't agree with it because I would rather keep the autonomy of this is the Big Ten conference. We don't look to outside entities to determine our champion. We we go with our own system. And I don't like the system as it is either, because that doesn't determine the best team, whether they, your, your string of Illinois and Northwesterns is better than their Purdue's and Minnesota's by one game mm-hmm. in a 15 game sample. It's ridiculous. It's just, or what's going to be a 27 game sample uh, of those teams. I would like to see some type of, even though I never want a championship to come down to this, if it has to more of an advanced look to, at the metrics and the ability to dominate and control games against common opponents and and look at it that way point differential to a certain extent is not perfect by any stretch but is is such a what you just mentioned that strength of record component that's one of the number one metrics the committee looks at every year mark they cite it constantly every week when they do their ranking. So we're really talking about looking at a lot of the same things the playoff committee is going to look at, look, look at anyway. Yes. So use it, but don't allow the committee to use it. I don't like the weak stance of 
farming out your responsibility to a playoff committee that has nothing to do with your conference. This is the Big Ten Conference. We don't need decisions to be made by outside entities. Then should the league just go ahead and keep divisions in place and then just realign them geographically in a pure sense because there'd be much more competitive balance. You take those four new teams, you put them in the West, right? You, you, take, you put Purdue in the East with Indiana. You put Illinois and Northwestern in the East, okay? Um, and you do a pure geographic breakdown and the West is made stronger instantaneously because Washington, Oregon, UCLA, and USC are in that division next year. And that gives you a lot cleaner look uh, from, a, you know, a tiebreaker uh, procedure percent, you know, a perspective than going with no divisions at all. So I like that formula. I like that uh, format. Or you, you could go with 18 teams and three divisions, six in each division. You split up Ohio State and Michigan in the east. You've got a Midwest division. And then you hook up two teams from the current Big Ten West with the West Coast teams. And I've, I've laid all this out in various videos of how the league could be divided. And that was one format. Uh, and I ran the records of these teams over the last three years, five years against each other to figure out, okay, is this fair and equitable? And it is, there's a way to do it where it is fair and equitable and you split up the major elite powers and you balance it out from there. So, but then you run into an issue with determining who's the conference champion and who gets to that conference championship game because you've got three divisions, not two. So that turns out to be an issue and I am against with all these expanded playoffs now, which I am I am for the expanded playoff, but I don't want this to seep into what some people have proposed, and that's with these uh, outrageously large conferences that you almost have to have a mini playoff within your conference just to determine a champion to move on to the playoff. That I don't want to see. All right. Before we let you go, Michigan coming off the bye as an Ohio State guy, what are you looking for? What are you looking to see from the Wolverines, particularly as they go to Penn State the following week. And if you watch that game against Indiana, man, Indiana, I don't know what Tom Allen was doing at the end of that game. Okay. But, I don't. I mean, I, I just, yeah, that made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. I mean, Penn State. You're talking about the interception and yeah, where you've yeah. got momentum and there's under three minutes. And you play you, for a tying you field goal. Yeah. You go up four on Aller and you make him drive for a touchdown in the final two and a half minutes of the game. Right, right. So where do you see Michigan coming off the bye? Well, I don't think you want to ask me what I want to see out of Michigan the next two weeks and particularly against Purdue. But what we're going to see is now back to our previous discussion is now we can start to make comparisons and if Michigan goes out there and slips by Purdue and plays a completely oddball game that they have yet to play I'm not going to jump to conclusions like well Ohio State took care of Purdue and Michigan did not Ohio State's a better team but now we start to collect these games I believe there's going to be well five within the division and then the the additional ones outside the division to make some kind of comparison now I go back to 2018 that doesn't necessarily add up to who's going to win the game because Michigan was the much better team going into the game in the common opponents comparison and then we know that Ohio State put up 62 points but I do think that it's generally uh, a meaningful exercise to go through to start to add up the common opponents Ohio State's playing Rutgers this week we can check that one off as well and so we we will have suddenly two common opponents to look at after this this game but will Michigan continue to uh, dominate uh, against the Purdue team that although that was Ohio State's most impressive win of the season if you're looking at game control dominance from start to finish was against Purdue and this boiler uh, maker team is not as good as I thought they were a few weeks ago. They're starting to come a bit unhinged. So this is probably another 42-7 type game. Probably another game that 90 guys are going to play, basically. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I hope so. I'm up there for the game this week. Get the light show at the night game. I hope to see everybody play. I like blowouts. I like no tension. I like no nerves. I like it. I enjoy them. 
I just have blowouts every week if it was up to me. I like that. Like I like not having to be worrisome or stressed out. I I like just you know, boot to the throat and, and being game, me- merciless. I like it. Steve, this Penn State game's not sizing up to be what we expected it to be. The the one thing I can say for Penn State is 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 they 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 finally put the ball in Drew Aller's hands to make a big throw and and trusted the kid and he did. The the thing I'm concerned about is their offensive line I don't think is very good. Hasn't been good the last few years. I think there was a lot of talk that because of the return of Olu Fashanu that that as a top 10 pick in the NFL that that meant the rest of the line was good and and you know I I I can tell you as a Michigan fan we we had the the last couple of years of Brady Hoke with with Devin Gardner. And I've kind of watched JJ McCarthy and I've, and I and I kind of see what Devin Devin Gardner might have been with a real offensive line, for example, okay? But I mean, Devin Gardner's two tackles, Taylor Lewan was a first-round draft pick. The other tackle started for a Super Bowl champion and played 10 years in the NFL, all right? They, that, those offensive lines were dreadful because the middle gaps of those offensive lines. I mean, Michigan State just A-gapped, splits us to death, nearly took Devin Gardner's head off one year, all right? Just destroyed us because the interior of offensive lines were not good. So the tackles were really good. You know, but the interior of the offensive lines cannot hold their water, cannot hold the point of attack. And, and, and we just were, you know, the line of scrimmage was getting moved on us constantly, you know, and that's what I see with Penn State. What, what I see is that the guys, you know, it, the, the middle gaps there, they can't, they're not, they're struggling to run the ball, you know, against teams that can punch back. I, I don't think the offensive line is very good. I think Ohio State exposed that. And, and I think, you know, Michigan's got an even deeper defensive line, which I haven't said very often between the two teams, but this year I think it's true. So that I do think is a problem for Penn State for sure. I, 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 ultimately, winning the line of scrimmage against Michigan and Ohio State has been the problem for them in the last few years and it was the problem for them again against Ohio State this year. I'll give you the last word. Well, my last word is going to be about 2012. It's a shame what happened to Devin Gardner. When he took over at quarterback, I was astonished at how good he was. I thought this guy was been playing wide receiver. They throw him in the middle mm-hmm. of the season and switch him to quarterback, and he's this good. And here we are two years later in 2014, and nobody had developed him. I, I thought that Michigan team in 2012 that lost all those one-score games, including five points to an undefeated Ohio State team, I think that team is very underregarded. They could have been a really, really good team. Took South Carolina to the final seconds in the Outback Bowl. That was a really good football team that just had things break the wrong way for them. So no development there. I hope I'm wrong about Penn State. I hope all of that defensive talent that has been so amazing that gave up uh, big chunk plays, blown coverages against uh, uh, Sorsby and uh, Indiana comes to play against Michigan because I want that game to live up to expectations and I want to see Penn State not kind of wilt and be the, uh, the the third leg of this again in obvious fashion. But I want the game to live up to expectations. But first, of course, is this weekend and we'll see uh, if Michigan continues to roll. Good stuff, my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. You bet. This week's Twitter poll results. What one word best describes your mood as a Michigan fan right now? 35% of you said worried. Get the bleep out of here, man. Put on some depends. Worried. Please tell me those are Ohio State fans voting in our poll. If not, you're a bunch of bedwetting pansies. 34% said excited. There you go. 31% said pissed. Even better. Even better, as I said to Mark Rogers a little while ago, keep adding the motivational fodder, please. Please. That's why I'm hoping the college football playoff committee agrees with Heather Dinich and votes us fifth tonight. I would, I'll, I'm going to dance the jig if that happens. I'll moonwalk. I will be in my man cave moonwalking if the committee ranks us fifth tonight. I want that. Please put the chip on that shoulder. Please keep it coming. It's Michigan versus everybody, and I love it. That brings us to our feedback of the week. Payne writes, Steve, you are so weird, man. L-M-A-O. Well, I have no idea. What makes you think I am so weird? But thank you, nevertheless. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. 
Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, share, five-star review. Help us to find, whether it's here on YouTube or listening on iTunes, help us to find more Michigan fans just like you. You can follow us, in, follow us in between episodes as well on Twitter or X or whatever the X we're calling it now. All right, at Michigan Podcast on Twitter is where you'll find us there, at Michigan Podcast. You'll find me at the Big House Saturday night, heading back there for the hopefully now perennial pilgrimage uh, to God's country. All right, the Big House, the Promised Land, Watch Michigan name the score against Purdue on Saturday night. Check out that dope new laser show. Looking forward to that. And looking forward to being back here next week to talk about that and preview the big game at Happy Valley against Penn State. Until then, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.